Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar, Solidarity Webinar of Foot and Ankle Surgery of Metartis. Uh, we started these webinars um, internationally to uh, transduce our knowledge to people around the world, especially in these hard times of COVID-19 virus uh, pandemic situation to keep us educated and uh, Medartis was so kind to uh, put us uh, a technology and allow us to to give these webinars within colleagues. So um, now today we have um, the topic of Bonian surgery and nobody else as good as uh, Dr. Lawrence Robin can uh, give us a nice talk on this because he's very experienced in this area. He's the past president of the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons, and he's the director of the Foot and Ankle Surgery uh, Fellowship Program, uh, DPM Program of Virginia. And um, he's a very uh, experienced surgeon, an excellent teacher and a good friend. So I want to uh, thank you, Lawrence, for being so kind and give this excellent talk. And uh, I give the podium for your words. Well, thank you. And Vic. then, please, uh, on the end of this webinar, you can write questions. And Lucas, who is moderating in the back, will pass this then to Dr. Rubin. And at the end, we will have a nice discussion. So, thanks a lot. And everybody stay health, healthy around the world. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I have been tasked with the subject of bunion surgery. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Med Artists for sponsoring this, and uh, uh, Professor Dr. Valdebarano for uh, uh, organizing and, and uh, gathering us all together, and you, the audience, for taking time uh, to participate uh, in these programs. Uh, some rules about Zoom. Uh, please mute, mute your microphone. Uh, so that we don't hear background ambient noise. Uh, please, please turn off your video cameras uh, so it's not distracting. And questions at the end of the, at the, end of the presentation, uh, either through chat or uh, you can unmute your microphone and ask. Or, uh, that, those are the ways we can do it. Uh, but certainly happy to take questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, the presentation will be on bunion surgery. First, I'll show you some tips and tricks and things I've been doing over the last 30 years of, of, of foot and ankle surgery. Uh, I would like to show you a new way that I've been doing the Aiken osteotomy, uh, something I think that we uh, don't uh, do enough of, uh, and then we'll do some cases and some questions. The bunion uh, surgery has, I think, several goals. And first of all, this is a game of millimeters, unlike when we're in the rear foot and ankle, where we have a lot more room and uh, places to, to make mistakes. This is a very tight area, very small amount of bone to deal with, and there's not a lot of room for errors. Uh, this is a game of millimeters, as I like to say. So what are the goals of bunion surgery? Well, I think the first goal, it has to feel good, right? They have to be out of pain. That's what they came for. That's what they wanted. And, and so the pain has to be gone. The second goal, I believe, is has to function well. Uh, always nervous about a stiff first metatarsal phalangeal joint after bunion surgery. Uh, so I believe that these not only have to work well, uh, but feel good as well. And uh, the function is important. We know that if we don't have good post-op range of motion, we're going to get complaints of either a floating toe or sesamoiditis from uh, lack of plantar flexion. And third of all, I believe they have to look good. Cosmesis is the difference between happy and satisfied patients. If we look at the patient on the left, I don't care how good that feels and how well it functions. She is not going to be happy. And from day one post-op until the day she no longer comes back, you're going to get the same question, isn't my toe supposed to be straight? And if we look at this case, look at the second toe, that's going to lead to a hammer toe because you failed to correct the, the uh uh, hallux valgus deformity of the bunion. And so this has to not only feel good and, and function well, but I believe they have to look good as well. Uh, and cosmesis is part of the issue for these patients. 
Procedures for bunion surgery, well, there's a plethora. There's just dozens of procedures. But basically, if we break it down into three kinds of procedures, there are distal metatarsal osteotomies, and I've included the Aiken on this because I think the Aiken is kind of a sort of a distal metatarsal osteotomy. There are proximal metatarsal osteotomies, closing and opening base wedges, and arthrodesis procedure, either at the first metatarsal phalangeal joint or the metatarsal cuneiform joint. But these are our choices of procedures when we look at that patient and decide what are we going to do to them. To that point, this is what influences our decision making. Certainly, the patient on the right had poor decision making preoperatively by their surgeon because this is not a result that the patient's going to be happy with. We see, we see shortening, we see continued hallux valgus, we see continued uh, intermetatarsal angle uh, with bunion deformity. So, when we're making that decision, uh, we have to look at intermetatarsal angles, hallux abducto valgus angles. We have to look at the first metatarsal length, and that will determine what we can do and what we should do, whether we have to grasp. Tangential articular set angle is not something that's commonly known and something I discuss with my residents. It is the angulation of the articular cartilage of the first met based on the bisection of the second met. The proximal articular set angle has never made a lot of sense to me and studies kind of show that there's a lot of variability because you're basing uh, angles on deformity. We're going to structurally correct the first metatarsal because it's deformed. So basing angles on deformity never made sense to me. The second metatarsal is constant. We're not, mess, we're not uh, uh, revising the second metatarsal. So when I look at the articular surface of the first met, I want to see how that's going to line up with the bisection of the second metatarsal, and that's the tangential articular set angle. The condition of the cartilage. Uh, we talked about range of motion before and, and function. Is the cartilage good enough that we can do a non-arthrodesis or should we look at arthrodesis procedures to fix the patient's um, deformity? Sesamoid position. The next two parts, obliquity of the proximal phalanx and asymmetry of the distal phalanx. Sometimes we can't uh, correct out uh, the deformity at the distal phalanx, well, oftentimes. So we're gonna do a cheater aching at the proximal phalanx, and I'll show you that later on down the line on how we can correct these deformities. And then the mobility of the first metatarsal cuneiform joint. If I have a hypermobile first ray, regardless of what the intermetatarsal angle is, I'm gonna lead more towards a lapidus or a first metatarsal cuneiform fusion. And with any procedure, you have complications. And again, as I said, this is a game of millimeters. A few millimeters one way or another leads to a significant complication. Uh, if you look on the uh, picture to the right, I've done a reverse Austin osteotomy, and then I've done a tightrope, but I had to undo the correction that was done on the first, uh, by the first patient. And by doing that, I was able to realign things. So again, just a few millimeters one direction or another can lead to significant complications. And as we talked, uh, loss of motion, floating toes, or painful sesamoids. And as we all know, that once that motion on the first metatarsal phalangeal joint starts to, uh, uh, we start to lose that motion, it becomes more and more difficult to gain it back. Arthrodesis for bunion correction. Well, First, we have the metatarsal cuneiform joint fusion or the lapidus. I'm not going to talk about this. I believe Dr. Uh, um, Christian Ploss is going to talk about this. So uh, I'm just bringing this to your attention. Certainly, this is a, a form of bunion correction, but that's going to be handled in a, in a different uh, lecture. Arthrodesis at the metatarsal phalangeal joint, though, has been used for bunion corrections. Uh, we use it for poor joint surfaces, for significant hallux valgus deformity. And there are several studies that show that it not only corrects out the hallux abducto valgus angle, but it also has a significant influence on the intermetatarsal angle. Uh, by getting rid of the retrograde force of the proximal phalanx against the first metatarsal, we can grab somewhere between five and eight degrees of correction of the intermetatarsal angle by just simply doing a first metatarsal joint fusion. Proximal osteotomies uh, are good for transverse plane. I do believe that they can accentuate the articular uh, deviation or the proximal articular set angle. Uh, I just have a problem with the width of the wedge. It's, it's a bit of a guess. Uh, it's a little difficult to, to figure out at times. Uh, they can create shortening. Uh, they can, if you do an opening, it's gonna create uh, the need for grafting with possible non-union. I don't really do proximal osteotomies and I'm gonna show you why in a few minutes. But in my mind, proximal osteotomies are not as accurate as a distal osteotomy and not as powerful as a lapidus. They're somewhere in between. So I really don't see the need. If I need a distal, I need a distal. And if I need a proximal uh, osteotomy, or, or I will go to the lapidus.
And here you could see uh, the opening base wedge. And if you look at the middle picture, the intraarticular, uh, the intraoperative uh, C arm, I, I had a pretty good correction, what I felt was pretty decent. And then the post op is not quite what I thought I was going to get um, on the uh, uh, from the intraoperative. Uh, C-arm pictures. Here again, the wedges is difficult to, to determine. Even worse is the closing base wedge. And you can see on the green circle, there's the wedge I've chosen, but that's purely a guess. There's no geometry or, or mathematics here. It, it's a bit of a guess, and I'm hoping I get it right. And if I don't get it right, if I get it too big, it's going to be a big wedge, and that's hard to fix. And if it's too small, I'll probably crack the hinge. But every once in a while, as you can see on this post op picture, I do get it right. But this is a, uh, a um, a difficult wedge to, to do and, uh, and to get correct on the first try. My, my go-to osteotomy for the most part is a large displacement distal metatarsal osteotomy. Um, it's usually greater than 15 degrees correction. We always talk about uh, intermetatarsal angles being 15 degrees or less, uh, but this I do quite frequently 15 uh, up to 19 or 20 degrees. Uh, it's usually a greater than 50 degrees uh, percent displacement, uh, and we'll talk about how to, well, we'll show you how you have to do a, what I call a belt and suspenders approach, where I will throw an axial 6-2K wire to give myself a little bit more uh, stability on a, on a significant displacement of a distal metatarsal osteotomy. I also like it because unlike the proximal osteotomies, it can correct the intermetatarsal angle, and I can swivel to realign the articular surfaces. So I can correct more than one uh, plane of deformity with a distal metatarsal osteotomy, where it's not so easy to do uh, with a proximal osteotomy, or even a lapidus for that matter. There are several studies, if we look, that show that displacement, uh, significant displacement for high intermetatarsal angles uh, does not cause significant postoperative complications. If we look at these two studies, um, uh, you can see that uh, there was no avascular necrosis, no uh, non-unions or delayed unions uh, in, these, in these studies. Uh, one dislocated capital fragment. <clears throat> so we can get large correction, push the, end, uh, push the head over significantly without significant complication rates. So if we look at this x-ray, this is a significant push. Uh, the problem we see frequently is right in here. You see this loss of bone, especially when you, you trim up the cortex here. You're often in the medullary canal. Um, I will oftentimes use this piece of bone that I, I, I resect, and then I will graft in this defect right here with that piece of bone. Uh, but I'm prepared that I'm usually looking at the medullary canal on a large displacement osteotomy. <clears throat> In here, you're actually looking at the lateral cortex. So the medial cortex is now gone, and we will have to uh, replace that or, or fill that in with some graft. It's done with a long dorsal wing. Uh, my preferred fixation is either a 2.8 or a 2.3. You can use 2.2 screws. I'm not a huge fan of cannulated screws in this area. Uh, and then usually an axial 6.2K wire, uh, and that will hold me in place. Uh, the axial 6.2K wire usually gets pulled out at somewhere between the three and four week uh, post-operative uh, point. Some other points here. Uh, I still cut on a K wire. I, I think precision is always better than a good guess. Uh, once I put the, K, the guide wire in, uh, as you can see in that picture, uh, my cuts are aligned. And I think it's oftentimes difficult to get that long dorsal wing where you want it without that guide wire in place and without cutting on that guide wire. So I am a fan of the guide wire. And that guide wire, when I put it in, in the transverse plane, is lined up with the tangential articular sound angle. So my guide wire is perpendicular to the bisection of the second metatarsal. When I push the metatarsal over, I'm heading towards the second metatarsal. I find that if I uh, angle distal, it's a little hard to get the correction because I'm moving uphill. And if I angle proximal, I'll get some shortening. So I like a straight transverse um, push, and it's going to be perpendicular to the second metatarsal. I also see a problem or a, a common complication uh, where we don't get coplanar cuts. When you have a long wing, if you've created multiple planes of, of osteotomy, the, the distal fragment wants to rock. And that can be very frustrating because if you close it down on the lateral, the medial's gapping. If you close it down on the medial, the lateral's gapping. And you're also claim, creating some frontal plane rotation when you're doing uh, your, your rocking back and forth. And so how do we prevent that? We prevent that by creating coplanar cuts. The medial and lateral cortical cuts should be parallel. 
So first, we're going to cut the medial cortex. And we're going to come all the way across, all the way through from distal to proximal. And when I'm coming out the back wing, way over here, then I'm going to punch through the distal cortex or the lateral cortex, and I'm going to go from distal. I'm sorry, from proximal back to distal, and I'm using the medial cortex cut to line up the saw blade for my lateral cortex cut. I'm keeping my eye on the guide wire, but I'm letting that medial cortex osteotomy line up that lateral uh, osteotomy uh, so I get coplanar cuts, parallel cuts of the, of the medial and lateral cortices. So here you can see a great case, increased in the metatarsal angle. Uh, you can see she has the same foreign body. This was not bothering her, so I didn't mix and match x-rays. We have an increased inner metatarsal angle, increased hallux abductal valgus angle, sesamoid shift, deviation of the articular surface. And by creating this large uh, displacement osteotomy with a long dorsal wing, um, and I think here you can see the graph that I was talking about. Right there is one piece, and one right there is the other piece. So we don't have an open cortice. Um, we can get good correction. Here we've aligned the intermetatarsal angle, aligned the sesamoids, corrected out the hallux valgus, realigned the articular surfaces, and preserved the metatarsal parabola. So this gave me everything I wanted. And you would look at that and say, well, that's a pretty large IM angle, but the correction speaks for itself um, in this case. Doesn't always go well though, does it? And uh, I thought I'd show a case because someone's gonna say, well, I know that once in a while they go bad and I would show this. This was actually my next door neighbor. Uh, this was her original uh, X-ray. And I thought, well, perfect. I'll do a large displacement osteotomy. Uh, that will go just beautifully. I'll push it over, uh, get good correction and she'll be thrilled. Her first post-op visit looked like this. Uh, we have a displaced osteotomy. We have a fractured dorsal cortex. You can see where the um, blue arrow is. There's a fracture of the cortex uh, and significant edema. So I decided not to go back in right away, let things cool out uh, a little bit, uh, get the swelling under control. We put her in a splint and a 20 days post-op in a splint. Uh, the edema is improved, uh, but the post-op complication is sadly the same. Nothing has changed and we're going to still have to do surgery on this patient. All we wanted to do is give ourselves a better situation uh, for surgery, mostly calming down the swelling. I think sometimes on revisions, we're a little quick to go in there uh, and, and waiting a little bit, calming down the situation and letting the patient recover a little bit makes more sense. So the current situation is we have a displaced osteotomy. Uh, we need a large displacement for correction. Uh, or possibly a lapidus with a distal metatarsal osteotomy. We have a fractured dorsal wing. Uh, we have loss of bone surface to fixate. Uh, there's very little place to put any more screws in there. Uh, low bone fixation ratios. I talk to the residents about this all the time, what I call bone fixation ratios. Uh, there's not a lot of bone, so how much fixation am I going to be able to sneak in there with not a lot of bone surface to, uh, to use? And I guess the other part of this is she's my neighbor, so I'm seeing her every day uh, in the driveway uh, waving to me. And so on this one, we decided to do straight K wires. We left everything the same. You can see these two K wires are holding the capital fragment onto the shaft. We've regained our correction. These two smaller K wires are pinning the two uh, pieces of the um, fractured dorsal wing. I didn't want them to split anymore, and I didn't want to create a stress riser into the articular surface, so I stabilized uh, the dorsal wing uh, fragments with, with uh, smaller K wires, four or five K wires, uh, to help align those and keep them from further stressing and entering the joint. So here we're 27 days post-op, six days post-op from the original surgery, and that's the final correction. Uh, and I consider that a pretty nice save. Um, we've corrected it out. I've got the angle corrected. The sesamoids are in place. Didn't lose too much length on the metatarsal. And so, uh, again, that was not a surgery I think another screw would have done. And I certainly didn't want to go back and make an osteotomy more proximal or even a lapidus on her. I stuck to the original plan of a distal metatarsal large displacement osteotomy. Revered is something I, I don't think we do a lot of. I kind of like it uh, for the right indication, and, and it realigns the metatarsal articular surface. Uh, it's a wedge, and when done correctly, it's, it's pretty simple to do. Um, and you can see in this case, this patient came in, she'd had a previous bunion corrected, not too happy with it, still in valgus deformity. Again, that's one of those patients who's telling you uh, it's still in, in deviation. I still, uh, the second and first toes are still together. Uh, you didn't fix the bunion. 
uh, or the first, this is not mine, but the first doctor didn't fix the bunion. So we're going to do a revered an osteotomy and realign everything for her. When we do a revered in, uh, the first cut is parallel to the articular surface of the first metatarsal. The second cut is perpendicular to the bisection of the first metatarsal. And when you do that, the wedge is almost automatically perfect. Uh, you just can't mess it up. So again, if you do it that way, where the first cut's parallel to the articular surface, second cut perpendicular to the bisection of the first metatarsal, when we do it that way, immediately we're going to get the bisection of the first metatarsal to be perpendicular with the articular surface of the first metatarsal, which is what we want. In this osteotomy, though, you're kind of entering the articular surface uh, of the first metatarsal sesamoid interface. And so by doing a revered in green osteotomy, which is where the osteotomy goes about two thirds of the way through the metatarsal, and the second cut is on the plantar aspect so that you are not entering the articular surface. This cut comes out proximal to the uh, sesamoid interface that will allow you to uh, do the cut, get the wedge, but not enter the joint or disrupt the sesamoid uh, first metatarsal uh, inner space. And the Aiken osteotomy is the last osteotomy I want to talk about before we get to cases. Uh, look at this procedure, and I'm showing you the yellow uh, arrow to show you that I did not mix and match uh, x-rays. You can see where the screw was removed on the second picture, and you can see the difference in those two procedures. Uh, I would take that all day long. And if we look at the first procedure, we still have, uh, uh, um, she had a simple uh, bunion uh, repair that did not go well. Uh, we still have an increased intermetatarsal angle. We have a significant deviation of the articular surface of the first metatarsal with some degeneration noted. Uh, we have sesamoid shift. We have deformity of the proximal phalanx. Uh, so what we're going to do on this one is we're going to, again, do a large displacement osteotomy with an Aiken, realign everything for that patient. Indications for an Aiken, uh, I, we talk about obliquity of the proximal phalanx. I don't really look at the angles uh, of the articular surfaces too much. I look at the obliquity of the proximal phalanx, and I want the two articular surfaces parallel. And I also look at asymmetry of the distal phalanx. Oftentimes, the patient will have an asymmetric distal phalanx that's pointing uh, in an abduction uh, position, and that's still not going to make the patient happy. We talked about cosmesis, and obviously, we can't correct out the distal phalanx through an osteotomy in the distal phalanx, but we can do a cheater Aiken and correct out the deformity to realign the uh, toe so that it looks straight to the patient. It also realigns the flexor and extensor tendons. And after I do my osteotomies to get everything in place, I will oftentimes take the patient through range of motion. And if I feel uh, what I track bound or I feel that the, uh, uh, the, the hallux still wants to rotate in a valgus type position, I'm concerned that this, the tendons are pulling, specifically the flexor tendon is pulling the patient in somewhat of a valgus uh, position. And so by realigning the uh, proximal phalanx and therefore the insertion of the long extensor and flexor tendons, I can realign the pull of those tendons to get a more, uh, to get a better uh, range of motion of the patient uh, straight up and down on, on uh, in line with the first metatarsal. The Aiken doesn't really correct intermetatarsal angle, and in fact, can create an increased hallux abductal valgus angle. But I would also suggest that oftentimes, if I remove some of the valgus uh, position of the proximal phalanx and the retrograde force on the first metatarsal, much like a first metatarsal phalangeal joint fusion, I do grab a few degrees of IM correction on that first metatarsal. So if I'm again in a position where I, I feel like I'm pretty close to having to go to a lapidus, uh, but I've got a pretty significant valgus deviation of the proximal phalanx. For me, if I do a long arm V or a, a large displacement distal osteotomy with an Aiken, I can get significant uh, angular correction in the metatarsal uh, angle. So again, the cheater Aiken realigns the hallux nail. It's part of a, it's, it's a bit of a cosmetic uh, procedure at times. It per, uh, corrects out asymmetry of the distal phalanx, even if in the face of a normal proximal phalanx. And again, it realigns the pull of the flexor uh, and extensor hallucis longus. And that again, we, we do uh, the range of motion to see how that range of motion lines up on the first metatarsal head. So if we look at this patient, that patient's toe is straight. 
Uh, they're happy with this, but if you look at the osteotomy on the proximal phalanx, it's, it's a bit overcorrected. It's a bit of a cheater Aiken, but there's asymmetry of the distal phalanx here. And because of the asymmetry of the distal phalanx, overcorrecting the proximal phalanx helps line up that patient's toe. So in their mind, to their perception, they've got a straight toe. And I've never had a patient say to me, Dr. Rubin, have you overcorrected the proximal phalanx to make up for an asymmetric distal phalanx? That conversation never comes up. What does come up is my toe looks great, it's straight, and they're happy. Now, the cheater Aiken has gotten a bad reputation and, and not without due. Uh, it, it's been used many times for the wrong indication. Uh, as you can see here, that's not a good correction. And, and the Aiken was not indicated, it's overcorrected. And, and this is just a poor uh, um, correction for this patient. And, and the Aiken was just undue and uh, not gonna help the patient much. Intraoperative decision, I always correct the IM first. And then once I do that, I'm gonna take a C-arm and look. And if you look at the picture on the left, you can see the obliquity. Now that everything's lined back up, you can see the, clearly see the obliquity of the proximal phalanx, and you know that it needs an Aiken osteotomy there. Just leaving what you have on the left is just not going to make the patient happy, uh, so they need a little bit of correction. And if I'm in doubt of where to go with the Aiken, it's a little trick I do where you can see I'm holding the toe in the corrected position, and I hold the toe where I think I want it to be. And if my joints are congruous, then I'm happy because that's where the toe is going to want to sit. But if the joint is not congruous, then it's going to want to become congruous, and that position that I want is not going to be maintained. Here you can see the opening wedge, or the opening's clear space. The minute I let go, that toe's going to want to slip back into valgus position. This patient will need an Aiken osteotomy, because without an Aiken osteotomy, the toe will not sit straight. The joint surfaces have to be congruous, and I determine that again in C-arm by holding the toe exactly where I want it. Look at the second toe, look at the first toe. Everyone's aligned. The only problem in this is right here. So we're going to need an anchor to realign those joints to get congruous joints. So then the problem with the Aiken is how do you cut the wedge? Um, I always felt there were three ways to cut the wedge. If you cut too much, that was hard to reverse. And if you overcorrected, you were kind of stuck with what you had. Too little, you can go back and take a second um, crack at the, lateral cort uh, at the lateral cortex. But typically when you start taking a second um, um, osteotomy or another uh, osteotomy swipe, you're going to crack the lateral cortex. And then there's dead on perfect, which is a little against, the odds are a little against us from that happening. So there had to be a better way, and I'm going to show you that. Uh, there's a study in, uh, in 2019, and you can see that they, their conclusion was the high prevalence and wide range of hallux valgus interphalangeus deformities should alert surgeons that the possibility that a greater than three millimeter wedge resections may be required. Well, that's great. Greater than three millimeter wedge might be required. How much wedge is required? How much do we take? And is there a way we can do that without having to, to guess and, and be more precise? So my preferred technique, I call it once through with a screw. Uh, there's a four, you can see there's, I use a four or five K wire as an axis guide. I do an oblique osteotomy. I do one cut, no wedges. And then we feather the cut. And I dial in that cut uh, with a bone clamp to dial in the correction. Uh, fixation is usually one 2.2 cortical screw or a 2.3 cannulated screw by MedArtis. And I always make that final decision after the intermetatarsal angle is corrected. I showed you earlier where we uh, line it up, get everything lined up, and then do that last piece where we determine whether the joints are congruous or not. And if they're not, then I would almost definitely do an Aiken. Let's look at this procedure in a little more detail. Here you can see the 4 or 5 K wire. There it is. You can see my saw blade is lined up on the K wire. And that's going to do two things. It's going to help me line my cuts, and it's going to prevent stress, stress risers. I'm cutting into the K wire, and the K wire is protecting that lateral cortex. This is kind of important. If we look at this study in 2018 by Duthet, he clearly showed that compromising the lateral cortex increased the revision rate. And uh, by preserving it, we had statistically better healing times. So that lateral cortex is important, and I want to preserve it. I think the 4 or 5 K wire is integral in preserving that, that lateral cortex. So I'm going to play you a video at the same time. I hope you could. There you go. And you can see we've got the um, double clamped uh, uh, bone clamp here. I'm cutting on the wire. Um, you're going to see I'm going to keep pointing to the resident. There you go, I'm pointing. Because when you're doing the osteotomy, you wanna keep cutting 
medial, not towards the apex. You don't want to cut towards the K-wire. You want to cut more medial. That's where the osteotomy or the, the continual osteotomy. Here's your first cut here. You can see it right here. And you can see I'm punching through on the video. We're just re, right, keep going through the same osteotomy over and over again. Here you can see we've clamped it together. There's the saw blade and the osteotomy. And we're just going to keep feathering right through over and over again. On the video here on the right, you can see we're making the osteotomy. Again, I'm telling them stay to the medial. You can see we're punching through. And as you see, watch when I click, you're going to see the toe kind of go one millimeter at a time. See it in a second, I think on the second cut, they have to touch it up. And I can just dial in one millimeter cuts. There it is. So I will just cut, dial in one millimeter cuts until I'm happy with what I have. Here you can see the wedge that we've created by, by letting over the clamp. And we put the clamp back on, it's closed. I like a four or five K wire as an axis, uh, as a uh, pre-drill. So I get a good bite with my drills. There's the screw. And here again, you can see on the video, we're just going to keep going through till we're happy. So let's look at this case, a 34-year-old female with a large IM, increased sesamoid shift and a splay foot. Um, what are we going to do now that we have all the osteotomies and we know what we want to do? I would, I would venture to guess a lot of people would suggest a lapidus. I don't like that she's a little short on the metatarsal. I'd like to preserve that length. I really didn't want to graft her. Uh, full disclosure, her father is a uh, um, ophthalmologist, so I've got a built-in uh, critic. And uh, so how are we going to correct that? We're going to do a large displacement osteotomy uh, and a fifth metatarsal osteotomy. And, and look at that correction. I preserve the length. I've got the IM corrected. We've got the sesamoids in a good place. And if we look at the position of the toe here, and we look at the position of the toe here, that patient is very, very satisfied. Uh, and again, if you looked at this, look at the large uh, shift of the sesamoids, look at the IM angle, I don't think anyone would argue with a, a, a lapidus procedure on this patient, uh, but I was able to do that with a large displacement uh, distal osteotomy. This is a 54-year-old female here. Again, let's take a look. We have a moderate intermetatarsal angle. We have some obliquity of the proximal phalanx and asymmetry of the distal phalanx. So to get this right, what are we going to do? Well, again, I would argue this is a moderate IM angle. I think we can do this to a distal. I wouldn't argue with a more proximal osteotomy or a, or a lapidus. And this is what we have. So if we look, we did a couple things here. We realigned the articular surface with our with our um, our displacement osteotomy by swiveling it. So I've gotten correction. Look at the uh, look at the articular surface here. Look at the articular surface here. This is certainly not perpendicular to the second met, and here it is. So not only do I shift it over, but I've swiveled it to correct out not only the metatarsal angle but the proximal articular set angle. We've corrected out the proximal phalanx and overcorrected a little bit to make up for the distal phalanx asymmetry that is more obvious here than it is here. But here you can see the asymmetry of the distal phalanx, and that's our correction. Quite happy with that correction, uh, and, and it shows several versions of correction. Again, not just in a metatarsal angle, but we're correcting out the proximal articular set angle and the, pro and the uh, proximal phalanx. So our first question, 68-year-old female. Uh, she has abundant deformity, as you can see, moderate intermetatarsal angle with metaductus, so that we know that that intermetatarsal angle is actually larger than what we would measure because of the metaductus deformity. Significant hallux valgus, increased proximal articular set angle, right, over here with a crossover second toe. And the problem here, right, we know that if we do not correct out that hallux, we're not going to fix the toe. The hallux has to be straight. So, what would the audience do? Would you do a first metatarsal joint uh, phalangeal arthrodesis? Would you do a lapidus, a distal metatarsal osteotomy, or uh, a proximal metatarsal osteotomy? I'll give you a few more moments. So you, you've been listening to me because you're doing, oh, wait, we got some lapidus here. I'm surprised that only 11% of you are doing a first metatarsal phalangeal joint fusion. That was kind of my first original thought on this patient. All right, and we're going to end the poll. And if we end the poll, 15% uh, of you uh, did a 
fusion. The majority of you decided on a lapidus and some of you on distal metatarsal, a very few on the proximal osteotomy. So, oh, sorry. Dr. Rim, you might need to click on the presentation. Yes, there we go, perfect. I'm still seeing this though. Oh, okay. There we go. Okay, so there we are this. We're gonna do a distal metatarsal osteotomy. We're gonna do an Aiken. Uh, and, and the reason I think the Aiken is so important here is because, and here again, look at what we've done. We've just not corrected the intermetatarsal angle out, but by swiveling, look where this wing is by swiveling. And here you can see that piece of bone I talked about. When you do these large displacement osteotomies, I always put that piece of grown bone graft in there, almost like a stress strain graft. Um, we've corrected out the articular surface of the first metatarsal. We've corrected out the pull of the long and short, I'm sorry, the long flexor and extensor tendons. We've got good alignment. The toe is sitting really, right where I want it to sit. There's no abutment of the first and second toes, and we should have a good correction on this patient, a long lasting correction. But again, what I want to show you is we're correcting in multiple planes, not just the intermetatarsal angle, but by swiveling that capital fragment, we are able to uh, correct out the proximal reticular set angle. That axial 6-2 K-wire that I talked about earlier becomes even more important when you're doing swivel because the capital fragment wants to shift a little bit on the proximal shaft. And so by putting in that 6-2 K wire, it holds everything in place. And then I just use my screws as the belt and suspenders kind of approach. This is a 74-year-old uh, female, uh, inner large metatarsal angle, large hallux abductal valgus, dislocated second metatarsal phalangeal joint, hammer toes two and three. So here again, what are we going to do? Are we going to do an MPJ arthrodesis? a lapis or a distal metatarsal osteotomy. I'll give you a few more moments. So it appears most of you are going with the distal metatarsal osteotomy or the first MPJ arthrodesis. There you can see. There's our intraoperative. So I'm gonna do a large displacement, even on a 74 year old. And look at, look at the final result. Uh, I did a first, uh, I did a second uh, metatarsal phalangeal joint uh, implant. And uh, for those of you who are noticing, I always double pin my, K, my, uh, double pin my toes. Uh, I do that uh, for hammer toes all the time. I do that for two reasons. One, uh, crossing the joint with a 6-2, I think, uh, or with a 4-5 is a little weak and I've had them break. Uh, and if I throw one six two, 6-2, that corrects out the transverse and uh, sagittal plane, but the toe can rotate on the frontal plane. And by putting two K wires in, I prevent rotation. So I always double pin my toes uh, because I don't trust them. Uh, my residents know I have a, a, a saying, I always, say, I always say, never trust a toe and I don't. Uh, so double pinning makes them stay in place. So here we go. Look at this long arm. V, and by doing that, um, I got good correction. All right, so this is something I think we're seeing a lot of. Um, we're seeing these failed lapidus. The lapidus has become uh, popular, very, very popular. And along with this popularity has come some complications from that procedure. This is a 59-year-old female who presented with a failed lapidus. She has an increased metatarsal angle. She has increased proximal reticular set angle, obliquity of the proximal phalanx, uh, asymmetry of the distal phalanx. This patient was incredibly unhappy. Um, the, the, the bunion was still there, the toe is still rubbing, uh, very unhappy. All right, so how are we going to approach this? 
I'll give you a few more moments, but it looks like most most of you are either doing a revision of the lapidus with an Aiken or a revision of the lapidus with a distal osteotomy of the metatarsal. If we look at this, uh, we're going to revise the lapidus with a bone graft. We are going to, uh, that's going to get my inner metatarsal angle and metatarsal length. I'm going to do a revered in osteotomy to realign the proximal articular set angle. And I'm going to do an Aiken osteotomy to realign uh, the proximal phalanx to correct out the asymmetry of the distal phalanx. And there you can see what we did. Um, we did the bone graft with, with the lapidus here, regained our length, but then I had to do the revered. And if you took this angle and corrected out the intermetatarsal angle, you would accentuate the articular surface deviation or the proximal articular set angle even more. Then you would have had to have done the Aiken and done a real cheater Aiken the, the wrong way to correct out for pro, poor uh, alignment of the articular surface. So here, by doing a revered in, I realign my articular surface, and then I do an Aiken over here to realign the toe. And this is, again, another case I just recently did. Same idea. You can see this case, uh, a non-union, increased intermetatarsal angles, uh, shortening of the first metatarsal. This is just this is not going to go well, an articular deviation of the proximal phalanx. They knew that there was an issue with the, with the uh, postoperatively, and you read the report, the uh, previous surgeon said he corrected out the valgus position of the toe with an Aiken. This patient doesn't need an Aiken. This patient needed correction the first time in the correct way. And so in this case, again, here we are. We're going to correct out the intermetatarsal angle. We're going to do a bone graft to regain some length and do a revered in. I believe this is the last case. Um, this is a 59-year-old female with a failed first MPJ R3D uh, implant uh, with residual IM angle. So she still has a bunion, uh, deformity of the proximal phalanx, significant valgus, and a while that's rotated. She also had an interesting situation where she kept complaining about the swelling and the itching inside her foot, had allergy testing done, and uh, the allergy testing showed significant nickel allergy. So uh, there was no hardware allowed and uh, no remaining hardware uh, allowed in this. All right, so what are we gonna do on this? And I want you to start thinking about how are you gonna handle a while as well? What do we do for this deviated while? So most of you picked the metatarsal phalangeal joint arthrodesis. Uh, I concur. I believe that would be the way to go. I'm going to do a first metatarsal phalangeal joint arthrodesis. That's going to correct out some of the intermetatarsal angle and the valgus deviation. On the second met, I did not want to revise the while. I just uh, did not think that was the right way to go. And so what I did is a closing base wedge osteotomy on the second metatarsal right here and realign the articular surface. So here you can see the graft. Everything's done with K-wires because she just refused to have uh, any metal placed in her. And there's the final result. Look at that alignment of the second metatarsal. We've got that nice with the closing base wedge. I've got the toe aligned. The inner metatarsal angle is corrected. Uh, hallux valgus is corrected. Uh, patient's quite happy with that result. And that is the end. Thank you and stay safe. I'll take any questions. Hey, Dr. Ruman, many thanks for this great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I think, yeah, it was really highly educational. I learned a lot. There's one question coming in from Juan Manuel. So what's the maximum um, IAM angle to do a distal metatarsal osteotomy for yourself? Usually about 20 degrees is where I, I think it's more based on shift than anything else. Uh, but I like about a third uh, uh, overlap minimum. Uh, anything less than, than a third overlap makes me, it makes me nervous. But I would say 20 degrees is the, is the um, maximum in a metatarsal angle I'll go on a displacement. 
All right, perfect. Um, how do you avoid uh, atrofibrosis, uh, atrofibrosis postoperatively? One more. How do I avoid what? Um, atrofibrosis. Postoperatively, yeah. yeah. Motion. Post You've got to move the toe, which is why I kind of like that axial 6-2 K-wire as an extra point of fixation um, because to that point is once you get arthrofibrosis, it's very difficult to deal with. So I try to get them to do range of motion uh, immediately. I will also tell you that uh, um, I see some of my residents are on the line. Um, I'm a very big fan of, of dissecting the capsule, preserving uh, the uh, extensor hood apparatus and not scarring it down. So I don't like to strip all the soft tissues off the head of the metatarsal. I uh, truly try to preserve some of the capsular insertion in the capsule itself. Uh, and I think that's critical. Okay. Uh, and what do you do with smokers, heavy smokers? Like, remember, I'm in Richmond, Virginia, right? The, the, <laughs> you know where the capital of, of Philip Morris is? The capital of Philip Morris is in Richmond, Virginia. <laughs> okay. So we, okay. We have a lot of smokers in Virginia. <laughs> We're a tobacco state. Um, we, try, we try very hard to get them to stop smoking. And to be very honest with you, frequently I will hand them an article. I believe there's an article out there by uh, Fallon. And uh, Fallot and uh, his group did a beautiful article on not just uh, the effects of smoking on elective surgery, but the effects of uh, primary and secondary smoking, uh, secondhand smoking on elective surgery. And I, I will show them those, uh, those articles and kind of say to them, look, you, you know, this, this is in your hands. Do what you're going to do, but yeah. be, be forewarned that you are significantly increasing your complication rate. Uh, I think that's a good point. Then another question from uh, Jessica. Can you discuss the second MTPJ implant uh, you use again? What's the ideal patient for you? Um, so I, I think the, the ideal patient is a patient with degenerative joint disease of, of the uh, second metatarsal phalangeal joint. If it's just the head, you can do a, uh, uh, there's, there's uh, procedures where you can do just a cap uh, on the metatarsal head. Uh, I don't find those to work incredibly well. I just find the scholastic works actually very well for the second, uh, uh, for the lesser metatarsal phalangeal joints. Uh, it's a pretty easy procedure to do. And again, I don't think I'm getting great active range of motion. I don't need that. I need good passive range of motion so the toe's not stiff uh, during heel off. Um, and so uh, that's, that's why I use it. And that's the indications. All right. Uh, then a question from myself, because I saw you did also the classical lapidus in one of the last cases where you shoot the one, the last, I uh, think it was the most distal screw over in the second metatarsal. Right. Um, uh, how often do you do classical lapidus and when do you do it? Do you test interoperatively hypermobile, hypermobility of the first ray or when do you decide to do that? I, I don't frequently do between the first and second. Um, and if I, and, and if I do, I tend to do the cuneiforms, intercuneiforms. But if I do uh, the splay test where I've got the lapidus in place and I see um, uh, motion between the first and second metatarsals, frequently I will go to the, between the second and uh, first cuneiforms, run a saw through there a couple times, and then my screws on the plate, I run them all the way across. Yes, I will do a classical, classic um, uh, lapidus on occasion, but uh, it's not my go-to. My go-to, because I, I don't, if the first and second metatarsals are independent range of motion and I don't like putting them together. Yeah, okay, right. Thanks for that. Then another question from Eric Hem. What are your thoughts about hemiatroplasty hemi uh, of the first MTP joint? Great question. Um, it, it, the problem with that, Eric, is, is frequently, it's not just one joint surface that's degenerated. If it's a traumatic event, and I have degeneration on one side or the other, either the proximal phalanx or the first metatarsal head, then I will consider uh, a hemiarthroplasty. But m most of the cases, 85 to 90% of the cases, are degenerative joint disease of the first metatarsal phalangeal joint, both sides, and so therefore I do a full replacement. All right. Um... Any more question? Ah, okay, there's another question from Alan Steven. Have you always used double pins for hematos uh, or was it a learning curve after seeing rotation with just one pin? Well, I've been doing it for years uh, and it came from rotation because the problem is, is once those toes start to rotate, it's, it, you're gone. And you can tape the toe and the patient hates it because it hurts, but once the rotation starts, there's no going back. Uh, you're just gonna have to deal with that. Um, and so I've, I've been doing it for years, and I believe Troy Buffelli actually did a study, 
and showed there was no increased incidence of complications or uh, avascular necrosis of the toes by using a single versus a double pin. I used two, four, five K wires, uh, just like I, I drive them out the base of the middle phalanx, out the end of the toe, and then back through the proximal phalanx and across the metatarsal phalangeal joint, just like a single K wire. And again, uh, I don't get breakage of wires across the metatarsal phalangeal joint when I weight bear my patients mm -hmm. and I don't get rotation. All right. Another question from Saud Alshwali. Um, if I did a perfect correction, but when I stress the first and the second uh, MT stability, it opens. Then, then again, I would, I would uh, fuse between the first and second mechaniform joints. Mm hmm and that's a pretty easy procedure. The, the hardest part of the cuneiform, intercuneiform fusion, it's a weird angle. Remember, they're, they're kind of Vs. And so it's a little difficult to get the axis of the uh, intercuneiform joint correct. I just run a saw in there and push it through a couple of times just to rough it up the surfaces. And then mm -hmm. I, I run my screws in the plate longer to go into the, uh, uh, into the second cuneiform and pull it all together into the plate. Okay. I would suggest, if in doubt, do the intercaneiform fusion. You can't go wrong. Okay, I think that's a good tip. Perfect. All right, any further questions? Let's give them a few more seconds. All right, so thank you so much for this really educational uh, and nice webinar and this great cases. Um, yeah, it was a pleasure to have you. And you, ah, another Thanks, one comes in from Doug. What are your thoughts on weight bearing programs? So I let my patients uh, weight bear uh, on, on a distal osteotomy immediately. And on the uh, lapidus, they're starting to weight bear at two weeks. Uh, I think the evidence is quite clear that these po folks can weight bear on a lapidus. Uh, I'll leave that up to Dr. Plas, uh, and he's doing the next one on lapidus. Uh, but the, the studies are out there. There are multiple, multiple studies that show uh, no, no increased failures, no increased non-unions, no deviation from immediate non-weight bearing. Uh, I, I could think of three or four studies off the top of my head, and none of them have shown any increased uh, problems with uh, weight bearing on a lapidus. All right, perfect. Lawrence, thank you very much. Excellent uh, presentation, nice cases, very, very uh, uh, good teacher. Thanks a lot for uh, uh, presenting us such a good um, overview. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Excellent. All right, perfect. Then um, uh, this webinar is recorded. Uh, I, we will uh, upload this webinar on the website. And obviously, Dr. Ruben, I will first let you know when I have cut it down. And uh, yeah, All right. thanks again and have a great day. Bye now. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.